Well, this is the beginning of a very special week, especially in the life of Christians. It's called the Holy Week. It's called the Passion Week. It begins on this particular Sunday, which on the calendar is Palm Sunday. And as most of you know, or all of us know, we know that next Sunday is Easter. And, and in this Holy Week that is laid out before us, uh, it's, it's probably lost a little bit of meaning even for those of us who go to church um, and most, I guess, every, everywhere that I've ever lived, uh, spring break is always associated with this week. It's the kids are out of school the week going up to Easter. And so in many ways, this week coming up is more about people being out of school. And for those of us that have kids in school, it's just a, it's a game changer week. You know, it's kind of like a, a breath because we're going pretty hard since uh, the first of the year. And there's a lot of excitement. So if, if we're not careful, we can lose the significance of what is happening in this week that we call the Holy Week. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to, I want to take a few moments at the beginning of, of our time together, and I just want to, I want to kind of lay out the events of the week. Just try to get your mind and your heart around what is happening during this week, during this thing that we call Holy Week. And the way that we get to this week is we kind of have to back up. We have to start with the crucifixion because we know that the crucifixion took place on a Friday. Uh, we know that Jesus was crucified on a Friday afternoon and the, the Jewish uh, leaders and the people that were going to take Jesus off the cross and bury him uh, wanted to ha have that done before the Sabbath began. And on the Jewish uh, calendar, the Sabbath begins at, six well, it begins at sundown on Friday and goes to sundown on Saturday. So roughly six, six in the evening on Friday to six in the evening on the Sunday. So we know he was crucified on a Friday. So then you back it up and Passover was on a Thursday. And when we talk about the Lord's Supper and communion and the, Jesus being in the garden, all that took place on Thursday. So we, we start backing some things up. And that gets us to this Sunday that we call Palm Sunday and where Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. Jesus didn't live in Jerusalem. He lived in, uh, around Galilee, which would have been an, well, it's an hour or two car drive. I'm not sure how far of a walk, but it was a, it was a little bit of a walk. To get there, so he's coming into Jerusalem on this Sunday, leading up to this last week before he goes to the cross. And 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 Jerusalem and the area around Jerusalem is very similar to here. Uh, you can be up here on the hill and you can look down and you can see Las Vegas. And so as he's coming into Jerusalem, he would see Jerusalem. And the scripture tells us that he stopped and he wept over the city. He cried over the city and the people that were in it. And from there, he went into to the week and he did some things. And if you're familiar with the story of Jesus or you've been to Sunday school or you've read that part of scripture, some of these things will be familiar to you. Um, during this week that's coming up is when he cleansed the temple. Uh, he cursed a fig tree. I don't know if any of you know that story, but uh, uh, I, I can tell when you're reading the Bible, by the way. You know how I can tell when you're reading the Bible? Because you have questions. When you don't have any questions, I know you're not reading it. Because if you read it, you're going to have questions. And, and here in this last week, there's Jesus walking down the road, and he sees this fig tree, and he, cur he curses it. It's like, well, what in the world is that about? And that one's, uh, that one's still, I'm not sure anybody knows what that's about. He teaches about his resurrection, which I think is interesting, because just a few days before his resurrection, he teaches the people about his resurrection, and they still don't get it. So they're about as dumb as a stick. And uh, so we can relate to them a little bit, right? Uh, he, he gives the parable about the great feast, uh, the most important commandment when they come to Jesus and they ask what's the most com commandment that happens in that week. He, he gives the, the parable of the ten bridesmaids, the parable of the talents. A lot of you are very familiar with that, that, that talent. That happens during this week. During this week is when he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, the widow's offering when he's in the temple and all of these people are given all of this money and then this widow goes in and drops a few pennies and, and Jesus says she's the one that gave the most. And so all of those things are happening in this Sunday up until the Passover time. And then we get to Thursday, we get to the Passover day and, and Jesus has the disciples prepare a room for them and they go in and they have this Passover and Jesus washes the disciples' feet and when you go to the Gospel of John and you look at this long conversation that these guys had over dinner and, and Jesus talks about all kinds of things in this dinner. In this dinner, he tells Peter that before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. He tells them that there's somebody among us that's going to betray me. Among other things that he tells them over that time. And then they, they have their, 
Passover meal and we do what we normally call as communion and they go to the, go to the garden and the garden of Gethsemane and he prays. And he asks the disciples to pray and they fall asleep and then he comes back and they fall asleep again. And, and then Judas shows up with the Roman guard and Jesus allows the Romans to take him and, and he goes to the trial and then he's scourged and he's beaten and he goes to the cross. So that is the week that we're about to experience as we go through this week. And I want to, um, I want us to talk about Peter and Judas. I'm going to read a passage of scripture here in a moment um, that talks about uh, them. But as we unpack this this morning, as we look at Peter and as we look at Judas, the question that I really want you to ask yourself is I want you to ask yourself, who, who do I relate to? Who can I relate to the most? Now, I know what you immediately are thinking. Well, of course, it's Peter. It's not Judas. Nobody relates to Judas, right? I mean, have you ever met anybody? You've never met anybody. Say, how are you doing? And they introduce their son. This is my son, Judas. No, that just doesn't happen, right? I mean, you've never met anybody in your life named Judas. Now, you've met people named Peter. That's Sure, that, that happens all the time, but not Judas. So immediately when I say, who do you identify with? You're all going, but well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to identify with Peter. I'm not going to identify with Judas. I'm going to challenge you this morning a little bit in the fact that maybe there's more Judas in you than you want to realize. And maybe there's more Judas in me that I want to realize. So this is what the scripture says in Matthew chapter 26, 69 through 75. It says, meanwhile, now, that meanwhile is a loaded word <laughs> because the meanwhile means that Jesus has been taken by the Romans and they've gone on this trial. And um, Peter was sitting outside the courtyard, in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, you are one of those with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later out by the gate. Now, when you read the Bible, I really want you to read it slowly. And when you read it slowly, you'll have to notice something here because verse 71 starts off later, out by the gate. So Peter's moved. He moved from the courtyard to out by the gate. Another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. That is Greek for he cursed. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. And Peter swore, a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. In the next chapter, in verse 27, we hear about this, about Judas. When Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priest and the elders. I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care, they retorted. That's your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out. And hanged himself. So two men. They have a lot in common and they have a lot that's different. And what we're going to do first is we're going to look at some of the stuff that's the same about Judas and Peter. And then we're going to look at some differences. The first thing is, is we're going to be looking at the same. Hopefully you're taking notes. You've got your notes. You can write these down. The first one is this. They were looking for a Messiah. They were both looking for a Messiah. Now it's a beautiful day in Las Vegas in the desert. We live in a place where there's a billion things to do. Literally, then there's all kinds of things to do where we live, and you've chosen to be in church this morning. So you're seeking something. You're looking for something. And Peter and Judas were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for somebody to overthrow the Roman government. They were looking for somebody to come in and set up life the way that they wanted it. They were tired of being slaves. They wanted Israel to return to its glory, and that's what they were looking for. They were also looking for life just to be better. Are you looking for life to be better? Yeah, I think we're all looking for ways that life will just be better. Peter and Judas were looking for a Messiah. The second one, they were both called by Jesus. They were apostles. 
There's a difference between an apostle and a disciple. A lot of times we get lazy when we talk about it and we just refer to them as the disciples. A disciple is anybody that's following Jesus. An apostle is someone who was appointed by Jesus. And Jesus appointed 12 men. And Peter and Judas were one of these 12 men. In the book of Mark, early in the ministry of Jesus, we're told that Jesus spent all night praying. The only time we have in Scripture where Jesus spent all night praying, he spent all night praying on which 12 he was going to choose to be his apostles. And we get confused sometimes because we know the story and we've heard the story and we have it in our mind. Jesus walking down the Sea of Galilee, sees a boat and calls Peter and says, if you'll follow me, you'll be a fisherman. That's not when he became apostle. Peter didn't become an apostle at that point. At that point, Peter said, I'm going to be a disciple. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of disciples of Jesus at this point in time, but there were only 12 apostles. Peter and Judas were apostles. They were one of the inner 12 They both walked with Jesus. And what I mean by they both walked with Jesus is they sat by the campfire with Jesus. They spent cold nights with Jesus. They spent hot days with Jesus. They walked back and forth from Jerusalem to Galilee a lot. They they told the jokes together. They ate together. They They did life together for three years. Peter and Judas. The fourth thing that they have in common is this. They both experienced Jesus in his ministry. See, there was this time when, when they were all in a boat and Jesus was taking a nap and the, <laughs> and the weather was horrendous and the fishermen on the boat were scared for their life. I mean, this is a bad, bad storm. And Jesus gets up after they wake him from his nap and he says, be still. And the storm goes away. Peter and Judas were in the boat There was this time when Jesus told the apostles, come on, let's go. And they went to Lazarus' funeral. And Jesus talked to Mary and Martha, and Jesus wept. And then he walked down to the grave and said, Lazarus, come forth. Peter and Judas were there. And then there was that beautiful spring afternoon sitting on the side of the mountain and by the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is teaching and they bring it to Jesus' uh, uh, attention. You've been teaching a while and everybody's hungry. We need to let these people go. And Andrew, who was an apostle, brought a Lunchable to Jesus. He said, this is what we got. And Jesus fed 5,000 men and their families with a Lunchable. Peter and Judas were there. They were both looking for a Messiah. They were both called by Jesus. They both walked with Jesus and they both experienced Jesus in all of his ministry. And then the fifth one is this. They both denied Jesus as predicted by Jesus. Because in that night of the Passover, Jesus looked at Peter and said, he called Peter out, said, you're going to deny me before the rooster crows. And he didn't call Judas out, but he said, there's one among us that's going to betray me. In fact, they didn't know who that was. They started, they started talking among themselves and they started saying, hey, wait, who is it? I hope it's not me. And then Judas, Judas gets up and leaves. And, and we would think, oh, everybody knows it's Judas, but Judas was the treasurer and he had responsibilities to go help the poor people uh, and poor have, uh, have Passover. And so they just thought he was going to do his job. They didn't think about him going and betraying Jesus. But they both denied Jesus as predicted by Jesus. And see, when I look at these five things and I look at us, we have so much in common with them. We're looking for something. We're looking for a Messiah. We're looking for for some kind of deliverance. We're looking for some way for our life to be better. We're at church, kind of feel like called by Jesus. There's got to be something to this Jesus thing. You've experienced Jesus do things. You've experienced God do do things in your life and in other people's lives. And then we've all been, it's all been predicted for all of us that we're going to deny him in some way or the other. So Judas and Peter had a lot in common. But more importantly, they had a lot of things that they didn't have in common. They were different. And they handled a situation very different. And so let's look at how how they did and how they handled it differently. First one is this. Peter was surprised by his denial. Judas planned his denial. 
See, just a few hours before Jesus lied three times and said, I don't know Jesus, he pulled a sword on the Roman soldiers. I just have to stop and think about that for a second. A few hours before he denied Jesus, he pulled a sword. And as far as we know, he was the only one who pulled a sword on Roman soldiers. That's pretty brave. That's, that's, that's being all in. That's like, I'm there. And, and, and he told Jesus, when Jesus called him out and said, you're going to deny me, he said, no, not me. No way. I'm not doing it. I'm with you. I'm with you to the end. I'll fight to the end. I am with you. I will. All that everybody else can leave. I will not leave. Just a few hours later, we have Peter cursing at teenage girls that he didn't know Jesus. And I think he was shocked. You ever been there? You ever done something and shocked yourself? <laughs> I said, whoa, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I thought that. And it was just kind of like, whoa, it's right there. It's just like the surprise that that could come out of my mouth, the surprise that that could, that that could happen. I think that's what happens with Peter here, that he was surprised by his denial. But with Jesus, Judas, it was planned. He knew the authorities to go to. He had his number, 30 pieces of silver. I, he went to the Jewish leaders. There's no doubt they didn't start with 30. They probably started with 10. I'll give you 10 pieces of silver. no. 20 pieces of silver. No. When they got to 30, Peter was like, Judas was like, okay, 30. He planned it. He had to go get them. He made the deal. He took them to Jesus. Took them to Jesus. And, and, and most of us know this. He told them, you'll know who Jesus is because I'm going to be, he's the one that I give a kiss to. So he plans it. Peter was surprised by his denial. Judas planned his denial. Second one, Peter's remorse was instant. Judas's remorse was delayed. Peter's was instant. And when we read the scripture, it says that, that when, he, when, when, he, when he did that, when the rooster crowed, he immediately heard, he, he immediately remembered the words of Jesus and he was felt immediate remorse. Judas is not that way. Judas' his, Judas's remorse was delayed. In fact, Judas didn't feel remorse until he realized that Jesus was condemned to death. He didn't feel remorse about uh, betraying him. He didn't, feel, he didn't feel any of that. He didn't feel remorse until he understood that Jesus was going to be killed. Now, we know the whole story. We look at the whole story. We've seen the whole parade. And, we, and we're thinking, well, how could he not know that? Well, he didn't know that. That leads us to number three. Peter remembered the words of Jesus. This is a spiritual thing. Judas did not remember the words of Jesus. This is a physical thing. Uh, let me, let me, I'm going to have to unpack that a little bit to make sure you understand what I'm saying. Peter remembered the words of Jesus. He heard what Jesus said. Jesus said, you're going to deny me. He remembered. He saw it. He understood. He understood the remorse, and he immediately repented. See, Peter understood the spiritual nature of what was going on. Peter understand that what, who, who Jesus was, what he was about, that there was a spirit to this. This was not just a physical thing. Peter understood that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. You're a spiritual being having a human experience. Scripture says that God knew you before you were conceived in your mother's womb. We are not physical beings having a spiritual experience. That's what Judas thought. Judas thought that I'm a physical being having and looking for a spiritual experience. And when I think like that, when I think that I am a human being first, and I'm looking for a spiritual experience, I will be in trouble. Because what you'll do is you'll end up chasing spiritual experiences instead of chasing God. 
I'm going to chase the feeling. I'm going to chase the experience. I'm going to chase whatever. And I'm not going to be chasing God. Peter understood that he was a spiritual being having a human experience. Judas thought he was a human being having a spiritual experience. So what was Judas thinking? How could he do this? How could he spend all this time with Jesus and betray him? Well, many scholars believe this. Many people kind of kind of put the, put it together, and, and I very much lean to this. Is that I really believe what Jesus what Judas was doing was is he was trying to point, he was trying to paint God into a corner. He was trying to force the hand of Jesus. Because remember, Judas was there when Jesus took a little bit of bread and some fishes and fed a whole bunch of people. Judas was there when Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave. Judas was there when he calmed the storm. Now let's just say there is a political candidate for the president and they could feed thousands and thousands and thousands of people with just a little bit. And they could control the weather. And they could call dead people back to life. Who's voting for that guy? <laughs> Y'all are a tough, tough crowd. We got one person in the back that's going to vote for this person. Oh, now we've got three people. Oh, four. Okay. Y'all are going to vote for this person. Okay. You're going to, you don't even care. You might, you may have for the first time in your life have to vote for a Democrat. But if that was a Democrat pulling that off, you would have to vote for him. Right? Absolutely you would. I want you to understand what's going on here. Don't dismiss this. Don't dismiss this because you've never met anybody named Judas. The reason you don't meet anybody named Judas is because you are Judas. Judas is so caught up in the present. He's so caught up in the physical. And he's going, listen, Jesus, you, you are not coming through. You said you were going to do all, you said you were, you were the Messiah. And I, I'll show him. I'm going to send the Romans to him. I'm going to force him to do, I'm going to force God to start acting like God. See, when you get disappointed and or mad at God, it is almost always, it is almost always over something he didn't do, not something he did do. Almost always over something he didn't do. And we say things like this. Why isn't God doing something? Why isn't he taking care of that bad person? Why isn't he taking out that? Why isn't he taking this disease away? Why isn't he doing this? Why won't he give me a job? Why won't he? Why won't he? Why, why isn't God coming through? And the reason you're thinking that way and the reason I'm thinking that way is because I have convinced myself that I am a human being in need of a spiritual experience instead of a spiritual being having a human experience. And this is Judas. I'll show him. I'll paint him in the corner. I'll make him act. I don't think Judas for half a second thought Jesus was going to allow the Romans to take him. I don't think it was half a second. Because it wasn't until Jesus was condemned to die that he's remorseful. Judas is thinking physical, not spiritual. When Judas betrayed Jesus, he did so with a physical kiss. And as long as you and I are thinking Life is about the physical. We will miss the spiritual. And this is what Judas was doing. He was saying, I'm going to force him to do it because he wanted to control the here and now. I often, um, I often get asked this question. Uh, when are we going to build a building? Uh, actually, I get asked this question. That's not the question. I get this question. When are you going to build a building? 
And then I usually respond with, well, when you give me $10 million, we'll get that done. But until then, we're going to do right what we're doing. When I have the opportunity to meet with someone, somebody uh, comes to the church for a while and they feel like, okay, this is kind of the place that I want to be. And I extended an invitation to, to any of you at any time to sit down and have coffee with me, to, to get to know me, get to know the church, get to know um, what we're trying to do. Um, a lot of times when I meet with people, they tell me this happens all the time. That's why these lights are here. And that's why my wife put makeup on me for the first time this morning, trying to cover the shine and the, all of that kind of stuff, because... <laughs> Um, because Josh, he works so hard uh, trying to get it to look great. So we put it on uh, YouTube and we put it on our web page and stuff like that. So we do that every week so that when you miss church, um, you have that. And, and it's very common for somebody to come for the first time and for me to start talking to them, for them to say, well, we've been watching you. And they, they check it out. And so they come live. And, and then after they come and see what we're doing live and realize there's no snakes involved, um, they say, well, maybe, maybe, this could be, maybe this could be the church that I could be a part of. And, and so they'll ask. And so they'll take me up on my offer and we'll go sit down. And I just use this as an example to show you how ingrained we are in the physical instead of the spiritual. Because when we have a conversation and they'll always, you know, you know, go through history and background and how I grew up and da, 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 da. And then what they really want to ask is, when are you going to build a building? But they don't ask that because they're new. So what they ask instead is, well, tell me the vision for the church. So I get this question a lot. And this is how I try to answer. I said, well, Billy Bob... I use Billy Bob because there's not, to my knowledge, nobody in the room named Billy Bob. Okay, if it is, my apologies. <laughs> For lots of reasons. But <laughs> Billy Bob, <laughs> Billy Bob, here's my vision for the church. For you to stay faithful to your wife. And for you to raise the children, your children, the best you can to grow up and walk with God. And for you to be nice to your neighbor. Take care of yourself. That's my vision for the church. And most church people can't get it. Like, in fact, I hear this one comes back like, well, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, because you don't hear that very often. Because usually vision is associated with a building or a building project, something you touch. And here's what's true about every building that's ever been built by a church. It will be destroyed. Ever been to Jerusalem? If you ever go to Jerusalem, you have to go to the Temple Mount. There is no temple there. Every building, every church building that's ever been built at one point in time is going to be destroyed. But your soul will live in eternity somewhere. And so that's what has to be our vision. That's what has to be what we're about. Now, do we need buildings to meet in? Absolutely. That's not the point. Judas was so focused on the here and the now. What can you do for me right now? That he figured that if he could paint God into a corner... God would respond the way that Judas wanted him to respond. Fourth thing is this. Peter did not try to fix his sin. Judas tried to fix his sin. Peter just went out and confessed. Wept. Judas took the money back to the people who gave it to him. He went back and tried to fix it. He said, here's the money back. They wouldn't take the money. In fact, they said, that's your problem. So he throws it down. Peter didn't try to fix his sin. Judas tried to fix his sin. And number five, Peter confessed his sin to God. And Judas confessed his sin to man. The scripture just tells us that Peter wept. 
I said he went out and he wept. And Matthew, this, the, the, the writer of Matthew's writing to Jews, and when a Jew hears that, he immediately thinks repentance. And so the scripture doesn't tell us that, that Peter repented and it doesn't lay out his prayer, but just the fact, just that simple thing, that he immediately knew it, he remembered the words of Jesus, and he wept. He was repentant of what he did. And Judas went and confessed to man. He went back to the guys who paid him and he told them, I've sinned. And then he went out and hung himself. Because repenting to man will do nothing for your soul. Repenting to no one certainly will do nothing for your soul. Peter understood. Peter understood that he needed to confess to God. So who do you relate to? I hope you relate to, to Peter. See, what we have here is we have a story of two men who experienced the same things, had the same desires, walked with Jesus, saw what he did. Their denial was predicted. And so is yours, and so is mine. But God tells us in the book of Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So they both knew God. They both walked with God. They both betrayed God. But one repented and one didn't. And that's the difference. I have always been drawn to the simplicity of the gospel. And we see that with Peter. No, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. Rooster crows on his knees. Pretty simple story, isn't it? He realized he sinned. He confessed his sin. Peter goes on to help fulfill what we know as the local church. In other words, he kind of changed the world. Judas? Judas represents the other part of the gospel that has always been intriguing to me. It's the complexity of the gospel. Same environments, same stories, same miracles, same everything. No, God, I know better. If that's your stance, one way or the other, you will take your life. Not saying you'll commit suicide. Judas made it quick. Most of us simply die slowly. Two people. What you going to do? Are you going to follow the lead of Peter? Or are you going to follow the lead of Judas? God lets you choose. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you. I thank you that you give us second chances and third chances and 19th chances and Father, I'm so thankful for Peter and the fact that he was so gung-ho and he was so in and then he, he fell and he fell hard, but then when he realized what was happening, he knew to go to you. Father, that's our prayer. That in our denial and in our betrayal, that we would go to you. That we would take you, our sin, 
and our pain and our sorrow and that those times when we want to try to paint you into a corner or we try to want to make you act a certain way and Father, we just give that to you and we confess that to you. Because we want to be able to get up and go do mighty things for your glory. And Father, for those of us in the room that are hanging out with Judas and we just think that it should be a certain way. Father, may you break our hearts. And may you show us that the only way to a fulfilled life is to let you be God, to let you be Lord, and to confess our sin and not to try to take it into our own hands. Because when we try to take the spiritual into our own hands, we end up desperate and it only leads to death. Father, show us. Show us what it is that we're supposed to do. Help us to live this week like we should live every week. And that is fully, totally devoted to what you've called us to be. In your name we pray.